You're listening to Beyond Technique, the podcast that empowers photographers to bring their businesses to the next level. Hello and welcome to Beyond Technique, brought to you by Platypod, Photo Focus, and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamir Young, and I'm joined by my amazing co-host and king of Florida, Skip Cohen. Skip, whoa, how are you? Well, I don't know <laughs> if I want to be king of Florida every time the governor makes it into the news. So <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe I'll pass on the, on the king oh. title. <laughs> But yeah, Florida, this is this is the perfect time of year down here, by the way, because the most of the snowbirds haven't shown up yet. Mm. And that'll be they'll all start coming in around Christmas. But you've got this little window where summer's over and things quiet down a little and the humidity starts getting lower. And it's just this is a nice time to be in Florida um, with amazing sunrises because everybody always looks at the sunset. And we were out early this morning. And I was so frustrated, the only camera I had with me was my phone. So <laughs> let's get into this podcast because, you know, just to say I'm pumped up about our guest today would be a huge understatement. Oh, my goodness. We've got, yeah, we've got Art Wolf in the Beyond Techniques house. And what a kick to catch up to him. Although there's probably nothing he can't photograph, he's best known for his images of landscape, wildlife, and native cultures. He's an author, presenter, educator, conservationist. And in all honesty, he's just an all-around good guy. Since 1988, he's published at least one book a year. So I'm going to let all of you guys out there do the math on that one. Now, the fun of, of having Art on the, on the show today, I first met Art at PPE in New York going back to my Hasselblad days in the early 90s. And he probably only had a few books out at that point. Since then, we've worked on a couple of small projects together, but he's always approachable and each photograph he captures tells its own story. Um, and usually it just might be that one image. And when you go to his website, you read his about section a little bit, you'll find quotes from some of the world's most recognized people on his about page. But there was one there from Morgan Freeman, which actually is the first one up. And it was one of my favorites. Quote, Art Wolf is a virtuoso whose eye brings home again and again the absolute need to preserve what we have. Close quote. So we're going to have some fun today. We're going to talk a little bit about Art's journey in imaging, but mostly about publishing and especially his new book, Night on Earth. And in terms of just to give you a little background on the book, Ruskin Hartley of the International Dark Sky Association wrote, quote, we hope the work of Art Wolf will encourage you to rethink your relationship to the night and natural darkness. Reclaiming our connection to the night is, is an essential first step in tackling light pollution and fostering a more just, sustainable, and beautiful planet for all, close quote. So, Art, this is where you get that major cue here. Welcome to Beyond Techniques. This is the cue for your lips to move. Thank you, and I'm so happy to be here with the both of you. That's all, that's all I've got right there. There it is. All right. I want to thank everybody for listening. We'll, we'll be back next month for the new podcast. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. There it is. Uh, well, Art, we are just giddy. If you can't tell, we are absolutely giddy to just talk to you. So excited. This is going to be awesome. Just digging into, into you and your work and your new book. Thank you. And we're going to kick it off with our favorite first question, just in case any of our listeners have been living under a rock and don't know who, who you are. Um, can you kind of fill us in quickly on, on your background and how you got started yeah. doing what you're doing today? Well, I, was, I uh, grew up in Seattle um, and in the 50s, there was a wooded ravine out behind my house, which I spent most of my time playing in. But at an early age of around seven, I got a bird book, a mammal book, a tree book. And by the time I was eight, I virtually knew everything in that forest. So I became a naturalist without even knowing the name naturalist. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was the school drawer. You know, I'd always uh, be drawing and painting and encouraged by my parents to do so. So my two loves were drawing and painting, but also always being in the forest, learning about nature. And... I stayed that course. I eventually went through the University of Washington, uh, got two degrees, one in art education and the other in fine art painting. And by the time I graduated from the University of Washington, I was also into climbing. 
I got my first camera. I started documenting all the climbs in the beautiful Cascades up Mount Rainier many times. And my allegiance has shifted during those years from fine art painting into photography. So everything I learned during the week of design and composition, I applied to my photographs. And by the time I graduated, I was you know, more into photography than painting. Wow. Just out of curiosity and for the fun of it, what was your first camera? It was a Fiesta, a Fiesta Brownie Fiesta. It was plastic. <laughs> and you had to squ uh, twirl a tiny little knob on the bottom of that camera, and eventually it would go from one to two. And that <laughs> meant you were, you know, advancing the film. And, uh, yeah, it was really primitive. I Do wish you know I had kept it. I know. I mean, there, there are so many artists out there that every now and then I see somebody that, that shoots a part of a wedding um, all in black and white on, right. on their first camera. I don't know where they find film for it. But somebody digs something out of mothballs. And it's, <laughs> it's so much fun to see some of these images because now that you look at the... You look at the light leaks and the blurriness and you justify it under the umbrella of, well, this is this is a fine art image. It doesn't have to be tack sharp and and, you know, have all the technology that we have today. Very well, cool. I should jump. I should jump in. My both my parents were wedding photographers and they both used both crown graphic and speed graphic, which were the old box cameras. So holders you know, black cloth that they would uh, be under. And eventually my father uh, started a little printing business, but he gave me those box cameras and I started carrying those up the top of mountains and shooting four by five black, uh, black and white photos of the mountains, a la Ansel Adams. Well, portrait photographer Don Blair used to talk about his very first wedding where he wasn't old enough to drive. He got on a bus with a four by five and an eight by 10 view camera and schlepped them off to the uh, wedding to do the portraits. So yeah. I, that climbing up Mount Rainier, though, that see that that puts it in a different category. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes. Well, and and those climbing uh, days and years led to uh, being invited as expedition photographer on the first Western expedition into Tibet and up the northeast ridge of Mount Everest. So it went from Mount Rainier to Mount Everest, and I was well on my way on traveling into remote areas around the world. See that? it was You, you just didn't realize that that was early training for what was yet to come. Did Can I have... interject? Oh, I yeah, did absolutely. at that point because as I passed through Lhasa, it was largely a Tibetan Buddhist city. And yet I saw the creep of Western civilization coming in because I saw a few TVs and people were mesmerized by the TVs. And I realized that if I survived this expedition, that I would be drawn towards cultures that were still remote and still really untouched. And that's what I wound up doing when I came back in uh, the spring of 84, is that I really wanted to travel into the Amazon, in, into more areas of the Himalayas, out into the Sahara, and document cultures that would inevitably change forever. And I wanted to get that on film before that happened. And those are the stories that you brought to all of us in every single photograph. Uh, hey, I don't, want to, I don't want to turn this into another one of those what did you do during the pandemic podcasts, but let's just take a minute and I'd love okay. for you to share with our listeners the impact that it had because you travel. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've picked up on an image or something that's been posted out there in social media and you're off on the other side of the world. Um, what, ha what, what happened in that, in that stretch of the pandemic in terms of, of your photography? Well, I did travel. In fact, I traveled to Africa a couple of times during the pandemic and uh, down to Mexico once, um, keeping up with the photography that I needed to do f uh, for book production. But in general, I worked on my garden. I fixed everything that needed to be fixed on this old house in West Seattle overlooking Puget Sound. 
And I created over 27 one and a half hour lectures that became known as uh, Pathways to Creativity. So in short, I just kept myself really, really busy. And so the stress and the isolation and all of that really didn't impact me because I was constantly keeping my mind active, my body active. I, I just really kept myself physically and mentally active during the whole time. And so I didn't feel the um, stress and the anxiety that a lot of people have experienced over the last couple of, couple of years. Well, I love that you that you took care of your body, you took care of your mind, and you took care of your business during this time. Yeah. We've said it before on the podcast, but I'll say it again, as tough as the pandemic was, it was also an opportunity, and don't get me wrong, very tragic, you know, things were going on, but as business owners, it was an opportunity to, to get things done that we generally don't have the time to do. And that also includes fostering your creativity and keeping healthy more important than ever, you know? Um, and, and I'm curious, are, are there any artists that come to mind? So not necessarily the pandemic, but really early on in your career, were there any artists that come to mind that you followed early on that provided you with creative inspiration? Yeah, because, uh, well, Ernst Haas was a, uh, I think Austrian photographer that moved to the States and built his career. And he was one of the first, uh, significant photographers to use 35 millimeter and start to shoot things that were less static and, um, you know, profound than the large formats that we were just talking about. So he got into nature and photographing Olympic athletes and, and bullfights and, all those kind of things, but he experimented with long exposures. He really pushed the limits of what he had at that time. On the other extreme was Elliot Porter, who showed us great detail in the Smokies and you know the uh, East Coast mountains with great detail. So he also was very influential in, in my work. Ansel Adams less so, but I've still admired the work that Ansel was doing. Um, but those are people that came to mind. They were the ones that I looked at as I was coming up. Certainly, a lot of my colleagues from Jim Brandenburg, Franz Lotting, Tom Mangelson, people and Jim Baylog, they came up at the same time as I did. And so we all looked at each other's work. And you can't help but be influenced by the work they were doing. And you hope you could take an idea and run it with your own you know, um, journey, your own sense of Possibilities. You didn't want to plagiarize or copy, but you can't help but be influenced by the work you're looking at. Well, that's a perfect segue for me to ask about the influence and the backstory behind your new book, Night on Earth. Yeah, you know, I was actually having a, a large outdoor exhibit in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, you know, they can make prints these days that weather the storms. And so there was a, a maybe a hundred panels of photographs from an earlier book called Vanishing Act, which was Camouflage in Nature. And I had dinner with uh, one of my German publishers that came up from uh, Munich, and they pitched the idea of um, photographs at night. And I got on the phone with Deirdre, who's worked for, with me for 30 years and knows my archive as good as anybody. And I asked her, do we have enough? Uh, nighttime shots to actually begin a book project because we always would look at that uh, archive of slides, not digital, to see if there was a base from which we could launch a book. And then I would always jump in and do the last five years. I basically uh, said we did and we started that project. And once I know I've got the base, I generally will not re rely on that base. We'll reshoot everything in a modern era. But that was the inception of the idea. We brought it to uh, Inside Editions, which is our American publisher, and they have the first rights of refusal. And if they jumped on board, then we knew we'd have a book. And so that's how that all came about. It wasn't my idea. It came from a German publisher. Well, I have the... PDF that Deirdre sent, and the images are just 
stunning. Yes. It's, it's just Thank a you. remarkable, it's a remarkable body of work. Thank you. I, you know, I loved uh, a new project and certainly we live at a time where I couldn't have photographed half the shots in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we just didn't have the quality of capture that we do now. And so it was exciting to embark on that project with cameras that you could shoot ISOs of 4,000 or higher and actually capture the heavens and the sensitivity of reduced light at night. So it's a book that would have been a one trick pony if it came out 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But today it enabled us to photograph not only the nighttime sky, but cultures and wildlife at night as well. I'm curious to hear for you personally, is there a certain aspect of the book that makes it so special to you as you all were putting this together? Does anything come to mind? Well, I think what I just alluded to is mm -hmm. really the profound uh, uh, way to answer that. Mm -hmm. I love a challenge and mm -hmm. I love not having to repeat uh, ad nauseum a same concept. And so, so much of this book was new for me to go out and photograph pinpointed stars as opposed to star trails, which is historically the only way we could have included stars was to open up the camera and let the stars right there line across the sky as Earth is spinning in space. Now we have that sensitivity to get not only the pinpointed stars, but uh, comets and other things that would be necessary to have a full, interesting uh, variety of images shot at night. Fantastic. And I mean, every single one of these images I could see blown up huge on my wall. Every one makes you catch your breath in this book, just looking through the PDF. It's really outstanding. And I, Tony. you know, I, I, I looked at other books that uh, were being produced in the last few years, and most of them really celebrated uh, beautifully. They celebrated the Milky Way and the uh, stars at night. I think what we were hoping for was that night on earth would also allow us to incorporate cultures and cities and urban scenes and wildlife, which gives the book breath and variety that it's not just page after page of the Milky Way over Mount Rainier, over, you know, over everything. It had to have a variety of, uh, to keep our interest in it. I want to I want to go into that just in a little more depth in a different direction because every photographer I've ever met or just about every one of them hopes to someday do their own book and I think people underestimate in fact I know they do um, the discipline that it takes to do a book it's one thing to have an idea and a project and a dream and start to build your images almost in in sort of a project driven portfolio but Share some of the thoughts in terms of people that want to do a book and the discipline it takes once you decide to make that commitment, whether it's to self-publish or to a publisher. Well, I, I think that what you just said there is key. I think self-publishing a book is a good uh, way to start simply because you don't have to try to convince a publisher in uh, to put money into a book. Uh, you can do your own book and take the time to do it. And we, again, are living at a good time where the self-published books are actually looking great. The quality of the paper, the quality of the reproduction is great. So I think they're labors of love. I never look at a book as a means to make money. In fact, Night on Earth exemplifies the fact that there's no publisher on Earth that could finance the amount of photos overseas that I did to create this book. There's just no economy in it. So when I work on a book, I'm working on five or six books at the same time. If I go into the deserts of Africa, I'm shooting Night on Earth, but I'm also shooting Act of Faith, which is a looking at uh, the Earth's big religions, but also tribal religions and voodoo and shamanism. I may be looking at abstraction, I'm looking at all sorts of ideas that I can capture on one trip. Otherwise, doing one book only, there's no economy in it. So you have to let go of the fact that this is going to make you a lot of money. 
it has to be a labor starting off with a self-published book could get you in the door of a publisher and they might invest in perhaps a local book that highlights an environment that needs saving. I think those are the ways books are being done these days. Well, you just hit on something that there's so many people that look at the at a big long-term picture and miss the opportunities that are right there on their doorstep, whether it's a small park in the community, whether it's an open field. Uh, I remember a photographer that attended one of my workshops years ago who didn't want anybody to know where this incredible field of sunflowers were outside Indianapolis somewhere. Um, it was it was her secret garden, and she did not want anybody to notice uh, or find out about it. And there's so many things that are right. I think, in fact, it's something that I saw a lot through the pandemic of images that people were were sharing. There's so much to photograph and tell the story that might be with with within six feet of your house or six miles of your home. You know what you just hit upon is something that I say now because. Uh, one of the uh, projects I'm working on now is called Photography as Art. And what I'm doing is finding a connection between abstract expressionism, you know, Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, Mark Rothko, all these various artists I'm finding in degraded environments and cement bunkers and old uh, discarded warehouses and so forth and so on. So I'm telling my folks that are taking these classes, you don't have to have uh, you know, plane tickets to Paris or anywhere else. You can find it in your own neighborhood if you have the imagination and the vision and willingness to go out into Detroit or Bethlehem or Seattle or, or, or. And so it is true. You don't have to travel far. You just have to have the imagination and the willingness to see a subject in a new way. I love it. Oh, I love it. And Art, with all of the books that you've published and the projects that you've done over the years, do you have a favorite subject matter that comes to mind? Not at all. It's always <laughs> whatever is on the horizon. And it's not like I abandoned the way I was shooting 10 years ago. I'm still shooting that way. I'm just increasing my variety of subjects. So anything that I'm working on now is the most important to me. And that will change over the next five years, you know, and it will be something else. So I studied under Jacob Lawrence, one of America's greatest African-American painters. And he always spurred me on to look at subjects with new eyes, new vision, never to, you know, be redundant and bored. And so I've kept to those words and moved on with it. I've always taken the next subject, whatever it was. And I, I think that's purely out of the training as an artist, fine art major, art education major. I'm always reliant on that history to find new subjects and new ways to shoot the subjects. Well, that ties back into one of my favorite topics too. Uh, there's a book that Scott Stratton wrote a long time ago called um, On Marketing. And it basically is, it's about marketing and business, but the tagline is stop marketing and start engaging. And he talks about how important relationship building is in terms of building a business and your brand and your reputation. And a minute ago, a few minutes ago, you were talking about um, meeting with, with your German publisher who had the idea um, for Night on Earth. Share some of the some of the tips, because you are you are the ultimate relationship builder. I mean, I met you when I was president of Hasselblad, and it wasn't. I don't. I don't even know if you were shooting Hasselblad at the time, but it didn't matter. It was. It was building the relationship, and it's the way you meet, greet, and I picture that relationship building coming out, especially when you start getting into native cultures and the common denominators of, of you going into a part of the world that you've never been, and they've certainly never seen anybody running around with a camera from the United States. Uh, tips for people in terms of what it takes to build relationships. Well, I mean, it, yeah, that's a multi, uh, that's an octopus of a question, and I'll take one leg at a time. I think 
people often ask, my God, you go into these remote cultures like I did two weeks ago. I went into the South Sudan and out to a tribal community that uh, has these huge white cows. And it's very traditional. You know, the men aren't wearing clothes in the morning as they're dusting their cows. And, you know, it's just bizarre change of uh, culture from what I am here in Seattle. And yet humans are humans and they're all modern humans. And so you treat them with respect. You smile at them, you show them the camera, and they get, they can size you up in a nanosecond that if you have ulterior motives. And so I go in with open heart and no agenda other than to try to work with the people and let them know who I am. And I'm also often reliant on a local uh, guide that can explain in their language what I'm doing. And more times than not, and in fact, it's rare that we would ever be turned down. Uh, that's the first step, is to find somebody that can speak their language, not to jump in and start shooting right away. I often put the camera in the hands of the people I intend to photograph and let them look at the camera or even take a picture of me and look at the LCD at the back of the camera. So it breaks down that, that uh, you know, spans, expanse between cultures. Now, the other thing is we live at a time where People, I have friends now in Germany, all around the world. If It would be nice to look at the globe at night and then put red dots of all the people I know from all these countries around the world. And truly, you understand how much it's a global community that it used to be. As a photographer in the United States, you'd be lucky if you had friends across the country. But now it's really all around the world. There's not a s single place on the planet that we haven't dealt with. And I, along with a friend of mine, do Earth is Our Witness, where we interview photographers from everywhere. And uh, it's really nice to have that community, different languages, different perspectives, and yet we're talking on the same platform. So that's yet another leg of that octopus. And so I think, yeah, you build relationships from publishers, from colleagues, and then you build relationships with the folks that you're photographing. I love that you highlighted wow. that element of respect art, because I think even looking around today, you've got young kids as if I'm, <laughs> I'm in my thirties, but people younger than me who are just, they think it's absolutely okay to go out and take photos of anybody and everybody without permission and then post it everywhere. And, and I've heard of some tense situations that have come about because young people don't know, or people, some people, I don't want to just pick on young people, but some people in general don't keep in mind that you have to respect the person that you are, that you're shooting with. And, and the fact that you take the time to, well, that you have a local guide that speaks the language and you actually hand the person, your camera, you know, the local person, and build this relationship with them before you even start taking any photos of them. I think that's amazing. It just makes common sense. And it need not be a whole afternoon. It right. can happen in just a matter of minutes. But I think smiling uh, and just having eye to eye contact and yeah, you know, the people that sneak photos, mm. uh, when people don't want to be photographed, they oh. do, you know, those kind of photos are generally not that great to begin with. Right. You really want that connection with the person you're photographing. You know, there there is a room for those candid shots where you're shooting from afar and you don't really want the people to be aware you're photographing and they are part of a bigger scene. So I'm not advocating everything's going to be in their face and having a friendly conversation. Uh, I think there's value in candid shots and beautifully so, but we're not in their space. We're not interacting with them. They're not even aware we're taking their pictures. And I think that's a valuable uh, contribution from a, from the world of photography as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm specifically talking when I'm doing portraits yes. or I'm trying to get intimate shots. I want the people to have a good time doing it because you can read that in their expressions. Have you met, did, did you meet uh, John I? I would have to run down to get my second book I ever did, which was, I think it was John Isaac. Yeah, he, uh, we did a book together called Endangered People. Well, I remember John telling a story, at least I think it was John, 
telling a story about an assignment he was on, and he'd been sent to some god-awful place in the world to document it. And there, there was a woman that had just lost her entire family in whatever the, the disaster was. And I remember John's comment that he just he just refused to take the shot. He said it was not wow. it, this was not the time to capture that particular image that she deserved the respect and the privacy and an opportunity just to mourn her loss. And it was yeah, I'm I'm going to be embarrassed if it turns out that it was somebody else, but I'm pretty sure it was John that I heard tell that story. It yeah, just I'm I'm it, I'm you convinced it was John. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful uh, uh, statement by John. I I do believe. I'm sorry. I'm looking back now over 80 or 90 books and 40 years, but I know it was John. And yes, I met him. And we both did a book uh, on behalf of the United Nations, and it was published by the Sierra Club, and it was called Endangered People. And I volunteered the entire shoot, and I traveled all around the world photographing indigenous cultures that were being harmed by their respective countries. And so that was the gist of that book, and it was John now that I think of it. So the answer is yes, I have met the man. Well, I think, I think that story about the importance of respect um, stands. Well, we're going to give John credit for it today anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know Shamara's got her favorite closing question, and it's hard to believe we're pretty much out of time. But um, what's the availability, and where can people go for Night on Earth? Is it is it already out and available? You know, it was on a ship along with all those other freighters off the coast of uh, California, but we've been assured. Yeah, I mean, typically if you do a book, you want it out in September. You want the book to be in all the bookstores throughout the fall season as we're heading into Christmas and gift, gift book season. And yet, this is where COVID has played out. Um, it was stuck on a freighter off the coast. And now we've been told that by January, uh, November 1, the book will be released. And that's that's a late in the season, but we'll take it. We'll take it. And the other thing I wanted to say uh, regarding our earlier question, I know we're running out of time, is when COVID hit, we had a lot of international trips that we've postponed, postponed two years. But the folks that have signed up, paid their money, are still on board. So hopefully next year we'll be able to get to Madagascar, Mon Mongolia, Namibia, and Botswana. Those have been standing in line for two years. Oh my goodness! Wow. So COVID well, has impacted us. If just just remind, I'll send a note to her after the podcast. But just remind Deidre and your team that you've got you've got a couple of publicists here that are more than happy to help. So yes. anything you have going on that comes up that was delayed or is new, if you just let us know, we'll we'll help you get the word out. Because this okay. yeah. this is the condition of the whole world right now. In fact, we've got a shipment of of product that's sitting on a freighter somewhere for, for a uh, platypod. It's, it's slowly making its way here. Yeah. We've all had to uh, exhibit a great deal of patience over the last couple of years. I'm telling but, you, you know, uh, but you know, the, the upside of COVID is amazingly animals have returned to a lot of their environments because of lack of people on the beaches you know, porpoises now are swimming close to shore. And I mean, I could go on. That's another uh, podcast, but there has been upsides to this. Well, right on the on the portrait social side um, with with weddings and family portraits, there is a renewed sense of family in this country. In fact, in the world that hasn't been this strong since since the 40s and 50s, when everybody sat around a small black and white TV or the radio listening to whatever the favorite show was that evening. I mean, people people were doing game night while they were hunkered down. There are so many photographers that I know now on the portrait side because the number one family gift this year is, you know, what does grandma miss the most over the last year and a half? It's your family. Mm -hmm. So it's the perfect yeah. timing for a family portrait. Yeah. Yeah. So, Good point. Very true. Very true. And... Oh. 
I can't believe we're at the end of our time here. You know, Art, I'm looking at your website and I see that you do have a link for Night on Earth. So I'll make sure to include that in the show notes for people to check out if they want to order. And I I do want to close with our favorite final question, which is so relevant now more than ever with everything going on um, in the world. What advice would you have for photographers starting out? And this could be business advice. It could be creative advice anywhere you want to take it what would you tell them to get them started you know i'd be at a loss to tell them business advice they have to want to be a photographer from their heart Mm. not to justify spending money on cameras because they have to justify it you don't have to justify it um photography is a creative endeavor and it's no different than writing or dance or cooking or anything else find a passion if it's photography jump in with both feet. It makes a person happier and live longer. That's what I believe. So no justification needs to be done. The minute you try to make a living from it, uh, there's added stress from that. But if that's what you want, nobody should tell you no. And then from a creative point of view, try not to fall into the lines of, oh, I'm going to put that on my bucket list and go and shoot that because we don't need another shot of the Grand Canyon or Mount Rainier <laughs> or, or, or go out and find your own subjects and you'll do better with your career if that's what you choose to do. Great Love answer. it. Love it. Oh, my goodness. And I do want to make sure and ask, where can folks find you and your work online? At artwolf.com. I think that's the simplest way. That's our website. Uh, www.artwolf.com and thank you for that. We have a pretty uh, a pretty good website where we're evolving it constantly to be better but yeah, that's a good starting point. There's a lot of amazing content on your website for sure. Wonderful. And uh, Skip, where can folks find you? Oh, it's always the same answer. Everything I write is at skipcohenuniversity.com. My email is skip at mei500.com. And we always welcome feedback from our listeners and suggestions for future shows. I'm also Skip Cohen on Facebook and Twitter. Nothing very fancy there, just my name. And Shamira, same question I always ask you. Where do they go to find you? Yeah, they can send me an email at Shamira at photofocus.com. I've got a number of different emails all th- out there, but they all go to the same place. So Shamira at photofocus.com. Hit me up with any questions, ideas, feedback, because it absolutely shapes how we move forward with this show and the amazing guests that we have on this show. And speaking of amazing art, this has been amazing is an understatement. Thank you so much. For chatting with us thank you for having me just great stuff and it's always it's always great to catch up to you although it should be a lot more fun at a live convention <laughs> ah, well that will happen in the future and we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well please tell your friends about this podcast especially if they have the burning desire to improve their photography business we look forward to having you with us next time on Beyond Technique, brought to you by Platypod, Photo Focus, and Skip Cohen University.